Good evening, everybody. My name is Professor Kieran Trahan, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Partnerships and Engagement at the University of York. Today's event is part of the University of York's online open lecture series. Although in a different format, open lectures continue to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you'll enjoy the adventure we're about to take you on. But, but first, a few technical issues. If you are watching live, you can ask questions using the question and answer button on your screen. This is available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have any technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event with the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again. I'm absolutely delighted, and it's a real privilege to welcome our keynote speaker, Amelia Gentleman. Amelia is a reporter for The Guardian. She was a named journalist of the year in, at, two, at the 2019 British Journalism Awards and won the 2018 Paul Foot Journalism Award for her reportage on the Windrush scandal. She has won the Orwell Prize and, and as a featured writer of the year at the British Press Awards. Previously, Amelia was a Delhi correspondent for the International Herald Tribune and in Paris and Moscow, a correspondent for The Guardian. Her first book, The Wind, Windrush Betrayal, has been long, long listed for the Gifford Prize in 2019. Tonight's talk sheds light on a very important and critical topic around the Windrush scandal, which saw thousands of British people wrongly classified as illegal immigrants with huge consequences. Amelia's book, The Windrush Betrayal, Exposing the Hostile Environment, asks why justice remain so el elusive for so many affected by the scandal. Amelia, it's with great pleasure and delight that I welcome you to open our lecture. Thank you. Hello, um, thank you, Kieran. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to have been asked. Um, I'm going to talk first about the um, the Windrush scandal, how it developed and how it landed on my desk as a reporter at The Guardian. Um, I'm going to show some slides, uh, show a very short film, and then I'm going to take a bit of time to think about why it is that approaching um, three years now since the government first apologised for everything that went wrong and promised to do right by those affected, why um, we're still really waiting to see um, justice to being done for most of those um, people. Um, I'm a reporter um, at The Guardian. I have been working in London um, now for about a decade after coming back from working um, in India and in France. Um, and my job day to day is looking at how um, government policy affects people um, beyond Westminster and, and how the kind of legislation plays out on, on the people um, who it's written for. That job has, has seen, um, has, has made me focus a lot on the benefit system. Um, I've looked a look at, lot at the NHS. And in the last few years, I've been increasingly looking at uh, the Home Office and immigration um, decisions. Um, it, it's kind of amazing, I think, for me to, to think that this issue of the Windrush scandal is something I've been um, really obsessed by now for over three years. Um, and I suppose to, yeah, I suppose it's quite sobering to realize how far we still are from getting, getting the resolution. So just to recap, um, the scandal was a Home Office orchestrated disaster whereby thousands of people who've been living in the UK for decades entirely legally 
were mistakenly de designated as illegal immigrants. Um, the consequences for many of them were really, really severe. Some people were sacked from their jobs. Um, other people um, were told that they were um, not allowed to apply for jobs because they had no right to live in the UK. Some people were made homeless. Others were denied NHS um, health care, despite having paid taxes here for decades. Some people were arrested and taken to immigration uh, removal centers. And a number of people were wrongly deported back to countries that they'd left as children, um, often half a century earlier. Um, this is something that I began first to look into um, in the autumn of 2017, when I um, was invited to meet a woman called Paulette Wilson. I'm going to try and show you a picture um, of her was somebody um, who arrived in Britain from Jamaica when she was um, about 10 or 11. Um, she came here in 1968 to live with her grandparents who were living um, in the Midlands. Her grandmother was working for the NHS and um, they had hoped um, to give Paulette a better life in Britain. She came here uh, entirely legally. Um, she went to primary school here, to secondary school, she um, brought up her daughter, Natalie, here. She helped bring up her, her granddaughter. Um, and she worked as a cook um, for decades, paying taxes. She spent some time working um, in the House of Commons, serving food in the House of Commons canteen to um, the politicians who would end up um, writing some of the legislation that made her life um, so complicated. And when I met her in, in 2017, she had just been released from immigration um, removal, um, the Immigration Removal Centre, Yells Wood, where she had been um, told she was going to be put on a flight and sent back to Jamaica, which was a country that she hadn't visited for 50 years. Um, Paulette was still facing um, deportation when I met her. There'd been an, an intervention from her MP um, and she had been released, but temporarily. Um, so she was still being told by the Home Office that she faced arrest and um, removal to um, Jamaica. And I was contacted by a charity who'd been trying for a long time to help her to unpick all of these problems. Um, she'd been targeted by the Home Office first in, in 2015 when they'd written her a letter telling her that she was illegally in Britain. Um, and naturally, that was a really, really terrifying thing for her to hear. Um, it became something that made life really, really difficult for her. Um, she was twice arrested before being sent to um, this immigration removal centre, and she was extremely frightened about the prospect of being rearrested. Um, for, for me at The Guardian, this was an interesting story because it seemed really hard to understand why the Home Office would think it was worth trying to deport somebody who'd lived here for 50 years, for 49 years, um, and, and why um, officials would think it was justifiable to send a 61-year-old grandmother to a detention centre when she'd done nothing wrong. Um, I interviewed her, I spent a long time talking to her with, with her daughter um, at her home in, in Wolverhampton. And we published a, a piece about her um, at the end of November 2017 in The Guardian. It wasn't clear um, immediately why it was that this mistake had been made. And it just seemed like a really, really incredibly stupid um, error on behalf of the, the Home Office. Um, we published that piece and the response from readers was Instanta instantaneous. There was a real sense of not wanting um, to live in a country where um, the Home Office treated people with such kind of draconian um, measures. Um, almost immediately as well, though, I began to get um, phone calls and emails from other people who 
were facing similarly difficult um, experiences at the at the hands of the Home Office. Um, so I had, I think, the day um, that that piece was published, and a phone call from the son of Anthony Bryan, who said I should come and see his father because um, he too had just been uh, released um, from immigration detention. He'd been held uh, for five weeks. He also had been booked on a flight back to Jamaica. And just like Paulette, he'd arrived in Britain in the uh, 1960s as an eight or a nine year old, had lived here all his life, gone to primary school, secondary school, had, had worked, had paid taxes, hadn't broken the law and couldn't understand why he was getting letters like this one from the Home Office telling him that he was here illegally. Um, I went and I interviewed him um, and again the response from our readers was one of total um, outrage. Um, there wasn't really any political response but we began to get more contacts from other people um, this is a communication from a woman called Val, um, who told actually one of my colleagues um, how she had had immense difficulties um, after the Home Office had declared her as, as being here illegally, even though she too had arrived here as, as a child. Um, she was asked to pay back uh, tens of thousands of pounds worth of um, sickness benefits which the um, authorities had decided she wasn't uh, eligible for and she was sent um, as many people were this kind of letter from the home office telling her um, that she was liable for removal and telling her that if you do not leave the united kingdom as required you will be liable to enforce removal to jamaica you may be detained or placed on reporting conditions and so, of course, these letters that it turned out many people were receiving were absolutely terrifying. Um, I spoke also um, around that time to Renford McIntyre. Um, I really find this picture really, um, really disturbing because um, it shows Renford at absolutely uh, the worst time of his life. Um, I, I've spoken to Renford more recently and he's doing um, th things have worked out much better for him. But I show this picture because I think it's kind of helpful um, to, to, make, um, to make it clear how profoundly um, people's lives were damaged by getting that kind of notification from the Home, home Office. So um, Renford McIntyre again had arrived um, from Jamaica legally um, in the 1960s as a child um, and had spent a lifetime here. He was working for the NHS in around um, 2015 when um, he was working as, as a driver for the NHS, but he was sacked when there was a kind of um, immigration check um, in the um, department of the NHS that he was working for. And he was told that because he couldn't provide a British passport and he couldn't prove that he had um, the legal right to live in the UK, he was not eligible to continue working. As a result of losing his job, um, he wasn't able to pay his rent and he became homeless. And as you can see, he's living here in an abandoned industrial unit in a place that doesn't have any um, anywhere to wash, doesn't have any heating and doesn't have a proper place to, to sleep. Um, it, it's, um, it, it was not immediately obvious why it was um, that the Home Office was um, treating people like this. Um, it wasn't clear why they were sending out communications that um, were kind of so deliberately intimidating and why such an effort was being made to try to get people to take voluntary steps um, to leave the UK. Um, it was only um, gradually after talking to more and more people that it became kind of slightly clearer what the um, issues were. Uh, 
we went on publishing um, piece after piece with interviews about people who were affected. Um, and these were people um, like Michael Braithwaite on, on the left here, who was a um, was working as a special needs uh, teaching assistant in a primary school in London, you know, doing a really important job. He'd been working there for 10 years. He was told by his head teacher after another immigration check that because he couldn't prove that he was in the in the UK legally, he um, would have to um, that, that he couldn't be employed there anymore. So he was sacked. Um, it, it was completely um, extraordinary that person after person who we interviewed would come out with different um, accounts of how their lives had been totally um, upended by um, this campaign by the Home Office to um, remove people who were unable to prove um, that they were living in the UK legally. Um, so here you can see, again, a number of people um, whose cases that um, we highlighted in The Guardian. And it's kind of almost in, impossible to overstate how severely people's lives were affected. Um, I, I mean, I kind of don't know where to start when I look at these pictures, but the, the man on the on the um, bottom row uh, at the left is um, somebody who, um, again, arrived in Britain as a child, um, who lived here all, all his life and who um, whose own children took him for his 50th birthday surprise um, or birthday present back to Jamaica um, to, to kind of revisit the country that he'd lived in as a, a very small child. And they went there and they booked a, um, they booked a hotel for a group of about 10 of them for a week to celebrate his 50th birthday. At the end of that week, they returned to the airport. Everybody in the group, apart from this, this man, was allowed to return to the UK but he wasn't on the grounds that he didn't have proof that he was somebody um, who had leave to remain in the UK. And I suppose I find his case particularly disturbing because I kind of think if, if I were in a situation where I was turned away um, from returning home after a holiday, it would be a headache. But I, I like to think that I'd be able to go to the um, High Commission and say, look, a mistake has been made. Can you help me? It took, um, it took this man 18 months of trying to um, persuade officials, both in Jamaica and in the UK, that a mistake was made before he was able um, to return home. The, the process of, of understanding what had happened within the um, Home Office to make this kind of, to make the series of unforgivable um, errors happen was, was it was a kind of quite a protracted process. And um, when I look back at it now, I feel, um, I suppose I feel, you know, if I were doing this investigation again, I would, I would be so much better at it and so much faster because of course, now I know that there were a lot of people who understood exactly what was going wrong. There were um, lawyers who had been working on this issue for years. There were some politicians um, who'd been seeing numerous cases like this in their constituency um, um, mailboxes every week, but there wasn't a, um, I don't think there was an awareness across the country amongst the people who were working on the issue of the scale of it until people started coming forward to The Guardian in, in great numbers to say, look, this is something that has happened to me as well. Um, and the, the cause of it is complicated. I'm going to try and, and run through it quickly. Um, and, and the fact that it is complicated, I suppose, is, is part of the reason why it was something that remained badly understood and, and hidden for such a long time. Um, but in order to understand it, you kind of had to go back to um, 1948 when the Empire Windrush arrived in Britain um, from Jamaica and other Caribbean countries, carrying um, on board 
around 500 um, people from um, Jamaica and other, other parts of the West Indies. Um, they were traveling to live in the UK totally legally. Um, many of them ha were people who'd served in the RAF during the war, had gone back home for a while and then had decided to come back and um, continue their lives in, in Britain. Um, and around that time, uh, legislation was passed that gave a, a kind of principle of free movement between Britain and the countries of empire and its um, colonies, soon to be former colonies, Commonwealth countries. Um, so throughout the 1950s, throughout the 1960s, around um, 500,000 people came from Commonwealth countries to live in Britain entirely legally. Um, there wasn't, however, any process of registration and the um, need to naturalize in the UK wasn't, um, wasn't stressed. And, and in fact, actually you didn't have to naturalize. A lot of people did, um, but a large number of people didn't. Um, and in kind of early 2018, a, um, academic unit at Oxford, the um, Migration Observatory, did a bit of research that showed that they believed that up to 58,000 people who'd come during that wave of migration hadn't actually um, got British um, citizenship in the years that followed. And that for me was the first kind of indication of what the upper limit of people who could possibly be affected by this problem was. Um, and that was really eye-opening because at that time, um, the Home Office was consistently responding um, to stories printed in The Guardian by saying, this is not a um, problem that is affecting more than a handful of people. Um, that the um, immigration system in, in Britain became tighter and tighter through the 1950s and, and 60s as kind of debates about immigration began, um, kind of quite familiar debates about how many people we should be accepting and what limits should be imposed. And by 1971, um, the kind of um, that that route of um, travel from Commonwealth countries was stopped off and it became much more complicated to migrate. But um, there was still no need for those people who come before um, the um, implementation of that legislation at the beginning of 1973 to get paperwork. Um, and actually, unless you were going on a holiday um, there was no need to get a British passport. I think I hadn't realised until I did this work that something like 19% of, of people who live in the UK actually don't have passports and it's not that unusual um, to live a whole life without one. And it hasn't been a problem. It's only um, in the wake of a series of uh, bits of um, legislation passed by Theresa May from 2012 onwards that not having documentation began to be a real problem. So that the second half of the explanation, and I'm going to try and, and rush through it, um, is that that, um, that kind of history of migration um, during that post-colonial period um, really catastrophically um, clash with a series of, of um, measures implemented by Theresa May and her Home Office in from 2012 onwards. And these were the um, hostile environment policies. The hostile environment was a series of bits of legislation introduced at around that time um, with the intention of cutting net migration to the UK to the tens of thousands. This was um, a hugely important kind of political imperative for um, David Cameron and, and Theresa May, um, particularly at a time when UKIP was getting um, more and more popular, um, winning um, seats in, in European elections, local elections, and the government wanted to appear to be very tough on immigration. What they did was um, increase the um, numbers of daily checks on people's immigration status 
so that whereas previously you only had to kind of show your papers or your passport at an airport or at a port afterwards um, you had to um, there, there were much bigger fines for employers who were found to be employing people who couldn't prove that they were here legally banks weren't um, allowed to give um, um, new bank accounts to people who couldn't prove it. People weren't allowed to rent property unless um, an individual could prove that they were here legally. Um, but the problem was that for those people in this category who hadn't naturalized, it was very, very difficult to get that naturalization to prove um, to the Home Office that that you had in fact been here since before 1973. And it was almost impossible to kind of extract yourself from that state of being without um, paperwork. Um, so this was an issue that we continued to report on in, in The Guardian. Um, and there was no real political response until um, the Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit came to London in the spring of um, 2018. Um, the Caribbean leaders were anxious to talk to Theresa May about what had gone wrong, why it was that so many people from uh, who'd been born in their country um, had received such tough treatment from the Home Office. Um, but for whatever reason, the um, Downing Street told the Caribbean leaders that there was no time during this um, schedule for Theresa May to meet them and to talk about this problem. Um, and that, that was a, a kind of, that was perceived as a huge diplomatic snub. Um, one of the um, ambassadors told me about it and um, we put a piece on the front page of the Guardian highlighting how um, the government had, had um, snubbed these diplomats um, and, and leaders. And within um, 24 hours, suddenly the um, government was falling over itself to apologize for, for this scandal and was at pains to um, express sorrow and regret for something that they described as shameful and as appalling. And on the one hand, it was absolutely great that finally there was a kind of um, progress and, and a response from the government, but it was also quite um, sobering to see that the swift um, shift from the government not acknowledging that there was any kind of problem at all to um, making really, really profuse apologies. Um, I'm going to try and show now a two minute um, video that just recaps on the kind of drama of, of that week. And then I want to talk quickly about what has happened uh, since then and why um, the kind of much promised justice for this group of people remains so elusive. They've come to seek work in Britain and are ready and willing to do any kind of job that will help the motherland along the road to prosperity. The relationship between this country and the West Indies and Caribbean is inextricable. When my parents and their generation arrived in this country under the Nationality Act of 1948, they arrived here as British citizens. Thousands of British men and women denied their rights in this country under her watch in the Home Office. Can she tell the House how many have been denied health under the National Health Service? How many have denied pensions? How many have lost their job? 
This is a day of national shame, and it has come about because of a hostile environment policy that was begun under her Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I share the Honourable Gentleman's admiration for the people who came here from the Caribbean and contributed so much to our society. I want to apologise to you today because we are genuinely sorry for any anxiety that has been caused. Yeah, it, it makes me um, bridle slightly when I hear um, Theresa May apologising for anxiety that was caused because, of course, when you think about the um, people affected by the scandal, um, people who we... Um, yeah, who we've seen on the screen there, none of them um, during my conversations with them talked about feeling anxious. It, it was just much more um, catastrophic than, than that. And it took a while um, before I think that sunk in. Um, it, it was two weeks after those apologies uh, that Amber Rudd resigned having um, misled parliament about whether or not there were targets for deportation. Um, and then we saw Sajid Javid become Home Secretary, and he made a number of um, pledges to reform the Home Office, to make um, our immigration system um, more compassionate and, and fairer. Um, and he also uh, launched a compensation scheme for those affected, which they um, thought at the time might end up costing the government anywhere between 200 million up to um, 400 million. I mean, crazily big sums, but based on an understanding that a large number of people had seen their lives uh, ruined for a long period of time by, the, by this mistaken policy. Um, so I suppose if I'd given this talk in, in the summer of, of um, 2018, I would have been very upbeat about what happened. There was a comprehensive um, set of apologies by the government. There was promise that the Home Office would be uh, reformed. Um, there was this promise of compensation. And um, quite quickly, we did see some really positive things happening. A, um, a task force set up by the government gave documentation to more than 12,000 people confirming that they um, had the right to live in the UK and indeed had always had that right. And whilst that sounds kind of um, like a, a, a bureaucratic advance, it's actually in incredibly important because it means that for each of those 12,000 people and their family, the kind of fear of having the immigration enforcement um, officers knocking on the door um, and, and, and arresting you was, was removed. And that was really, really positive. Um, dozens of people who um, were stuck in the Caribbean because they'd been refused re-entry into the UK were flown back at the government's um, expense. People were given their jobs back. Some people got their homes back. Um, there was a, a very um, stark drop in the numbers of people being held in immigration detention for a while. It dropped by 41% and a 20% drop in deportations for a while. Um, and so it did look really, really positive. I suppose... Um, where we are three years on, it doesn't look quite so um, kind of comprehensively positive. And that's um, partly because we are now on the third uh, consecutive Home Secretary to um, promise comprehensive cultural reform of the Home Office. And we are really yet to see that re reform. Um, so a year ago, there was a, a um, an internal report commissioned um, by the Home Office to look at what had happened and how the department could make sure that such mistakes were never repeated. And that Wendy Williams lessons learned report um, found that, um, that, that the whole department needed to change its culture. It found um, elements of ignorance and thoughtlessness on the subject of race that were um, 
in line with um, the, the definition of institutionalized racism. And it found that there had been a profound institutional failure on the part of the Home Office. Wendy Williams made um, 30, I think, recommendations about how to reform the department to make sure nothing like this ever happened again. And in uh, September, Priti Patel adopted all of those recommendations. One of them was to um, commit the department to reviewing the hostile environment legislation, which underpinned all of this. Um, but it hasn't yet happened. Um, and of course, comprehensive cultural change for a government department takes time. Um, but we are coming up now to, to three years since it was um, first promised. And then um, there is the kind of very difficult situation with the compensation scheme. Um, so that's been in action now for two years um, and they've paid out four million pounds um, to about 300 people. Um, a couple of months ago, it was only, they'd only paid out to 120 people, I think. And, and there are signs that it's beginning to speed up but I found it very, very hard to understand why it's so slow. Or rather, I, I found it hard to understand until I was contacted by um, a woman who had spent a year working in the department who um, actually gave a very kind of detailed account of what it was like to work in that, in that department. And she accused the, um, the division of, of um, being racist and re-traumatizing um, the victims of, of the scandal by requiring them to give impossibly high levels of proof that they had suffered um, in, order to, in order to be eligible for compensation. Um, she said there was a, a lack of humanity within that department um, and questioned why it was that compensation claims were being dealt with by the Home Office, which was the same um, department that had caused the errors in the first place. Um, this, this final slide is of um, five of the people um, most affected by this. Um, and I'm not sure if my face is in the way of, of the woman on the right, but that's um, Paulette Wilson again, who was um, who went to, to Downing Street last June with a petition um, asking the government to hurry up and provide um, justice to those affected by the scandal. By that point, a number of the people who we'd interviewed in The Guardian had died before receiving um, either their papers or, or before receiving compensation. And Paulette Wilson was very, very angry about this. Um, un unfortunately, a month after um, this picture was taken, Paulette died um, in, you know, prematurely. Um, she was only 64 and her daughter um, said that she had been immensely stressed and unhappy about, um, about everything really. So I, I want to kind of feel positive about what has happened. And, and I do feel positive about the capacity of um, journalism to kind of force change. But I, but I think it's really, really important to remember that we haven't yet had um, the kind of wholesale reform of the Home Office that's being promised and many, many people affected are still waiting for justice. Um, this is the um, book that I've, I've written about the whole scandal, um, which, which talks a lot about the um, kind of journalistic process of, of trying to understand what was going wrong. Um, it talks in much more detail about what the hostile environment was and the kind of wider problems that it's caused. Um, and, and I suppose mainly it, it gave me an opportunity to go into much more detail about the lives of the people who were affected. Um, because in a newspaper article, you're very limited for space. And, and the kind of really extraordinary thing about the scandal was how it was something that really reflected um, British history, British um, attitudes towards empire, um, the, the whole kind of migration history that we've 
lived through throughout the, the 20th century. And, and so it, it, was, um, I, it was important to, for me to kind of try and put the detail in there that wasn't possible to put into a lot of the, the newspaper articles. Um, I think that that is everything that I want to say. Um, I'm really happy to, um, to answer questions and yeah, look forward to hearing from, from, from you. Hey, thank you so much, Amelia. Um, there is so much to go on. Um, first of all, you know, the powerful insights that you've just provided, but also to thank you for kind of telling, you know, the real stories, the unfiltered stories and, and the impact that it's had on people's lives. And also about what we might learn about policy and practice within this context. So let me start with, um, there's a flurry of questions and I wanna focus on three key themes. One's going to be around, you know, policy initiatives, you know, the promise of tomorrow and how effective they have been. I'm then going to move on a series of questions about damage and hostile environments and, and reputation, and how we begin to build that back up. And then thirdly, I want to talk to you um, about the lessons that, that you think um, the government and, and policy have learned as a result of this, if any. So let me start with, with the first question and, and this um, you know, encompassing a series of questions around what would you say that policy, the policies implemented, such as the Windrush Day Grant, the Windrush Compensation Scheme and the establishment of the Windrush Day have actually made? What kind of headway have they aimed? made and have they kind of fulfilled the the aims that they set out to do in your opinion um so so i think um i think that the compensation scheme is a really important thing i think people get a bit kind of um uneasy talking about compensation because they don't like to to think of people getting kind of huge payouts and there's there's a sort of queasiness that people have about the idea of, of government paying people money to kind of um, atone for having made a mistake. But I think it's really important to remember that actually a lot of this is, is, is kind of a reimbursement scheme in the sense that there were lots of people who um, were unable to work for say five years. So they lost wages for five years. They were simultaneously unable to claim benefits and as a result of that they have been pushed hugely into debt some people are still um kind of fighting eviction um claims because of the debt that they got into because of the home office's mistake so the kind of compensation should really be seen in the in that context um and yeah i i, I mean i think it is important i think it is peculiar uh, that it has that it has taken so long for it to to start paying out and and really tragic in in some people's cases because by the very nature of, of this scandal it's affecting people who are approaching retirement age and some of them have become unwell as a result of the stress of this and and it just seems kind of unforgivable that the that the paying out of compensation hasn't been so far dealt with um, with a kind of greater sense of urgency. I'm, I'm hopeful that that's changing at the moment, um, but it's, yeah, remains to be seen. On the Windrush Day, Day Grant, I feel pretty cynical about that. Um, Patrick Vernon is a, a campaigner who's been campaigning for a long time for um, Windrush Day to be recognized and celebrated as a kind of celebration of the positive story of immigration. And from that perspective, it's great that, that the government has given this money. Um, uh, I think it's about half a million pound a year to, to mark uh, Windrush Day. But I, it, it's so hard to kind of um, separate that from um, from the kind of really terrible thing that happened. And it's kind of hard to, 
avoid thinking that somehow this was quite an easy thing to do, quite an easy PR thing for the government to do, to detract from, to distract attention from the fact that, you know, the, the policies remain in place and a lot of people are still having difficulties. Thank you. Um, we've, we've talked about the Home Office, um, you know, quite a lot, and you highlighted, and shone a really important light on the Home Office in this. A question's come through in terms of, and we really value your, you know, your thoughts. What started or initiated the Home Office to do these checks? So what was the trigger? So the, um, there have been um, checks on people's immigration status, I mean, for, forever. Um, and employers have for a long time faced a, um, a theoretical fine for employing people who don't have proof of their right to live in the UK. But until about um, 2012 or 2014 with the um, imp implementation of the first round of these hostile environment policies, that those checks were implemented with a relatively light touch. Um, there wasn't that much enforcement of them and the fines involved were, I think in the region of 2000 pounds, by, by the end of the um, implementation of hostile environment policies, employers faced up to £20,000 in as a fine for employing somebody who couldn't prove that they were here legally. And there was also a um, national um, prison sentence as, as well. And so, um, you know, the, the need to check that you're not employing um, illegal workers has always been there. But from um, 2012 onwards, when the government realized that it was kind of losing this, um, pol losing political capital around the immigration debate, they really, really wanted to be seen to be acting very um, tough on illegal immigration. Um, it was unfortunate that the Home Office wasn't very good at knowing who was here legally and, and who wasn't. It was unfortunate that they destroyed quite a lot of the documentation that would have, um, yeah, that would have helped them to, to um, distinguish who was here legally and who wasn't. Um, but nevertheless, they embarked on the series of measures. So the fines, but also a lot of other kind of really quite sinister things like, um, we remember the, the vans that drove around areas of high immigration that with the slogan on the side that said, go home or, or face arrest. Um, but there was also a, a hotline called a national allegations database um, that was set up at about the same time where you could call up and kind of effectively, you know, uh, report on somebody who you thought was um, here illegally. And also um, the, the Home Office was, was sending out tweets um, to show that they were really, really tough. So um, I think it was in 2014, they sent out on Valentine's Day, a, a tweet that said, roses are red, violets are blue. If your marriage is a sham, we'll be on to you, hashtag Valentine's Day. So there was a real kind of determination to be seen to be being um, tough. And, and all of this stems back to this um, manifesto commitment made by David Cameron, that he was going to reduce net migration to the tens of thousands. This was something it proved impossible to do. And because they couldn't do it, they, they tried instead to look like they were um, acting yeah, in a very, very um, fierce way on, on immigration. Great, thank you. Um, that leads nicely on to, to my next question. And I want to give the voice of um, students who are working in this space. So first of all, I just want to acknowledge and share with you, which I think is really important, um, a message from, from, from an English student who says, thank you for highlighting the scandal so superbly. She's doing her dissertation on Windrush migrants and their access to the city spaces. So the question that she's posing, which again, you know, um, several other members in the audience have also asked in different ways is, 
How do you think the scandals affected people's perceptions of themselves as legi legitimate British citizens with a rightful access to the city? You know, you spoke so eloquently in your presentation about the importance of place and knowing your place and the damage that does when suddenly what you've taken as being, you know, your home, your country is just kind of challenged. So your thoughts and observations about um, legitimacy and rightful access. I mean, I think um, there were a, a lot of people who were aware that they had an uncertain immigration status for years before um, the government apologised apologized and, and um, the impact on their lives of, of having that uncertainty was really profound, even if they weren't getting letters like the one we saw um, from the Home Office telling them that they faced arrest. There were a lot of people um, who felt that they were forced to live in kind of semi underground existences because they didn't want to um, do anything that might trigger a, a Home Office check on their immigration status. So I met one person who um, had had stopped working, who said he wasn't going to try and apply for a passport, even though he wanted to go and see um, unwell relatives. He wasn't going to apply for a pension because he didn't want that kind of process to throw up some kind of problems. But more starkly, he, he would avoid areas of his local high, um, high street where he knew that there might be the possibility of a, a police van or um, any kind of trouble that, that might somehow involve him in having to have a confrontation with um, authority. And when, when he told me about that, I found it really hard to, to understand. And I thought maybe he was overreacting. He was one of the first people who I interviewed. And now I absolutely understand um, how totally your, your life can be um, shaped by this really justified um, fear of being um, detained by immigration enforcement and threatened or in, in fact removed to a country that you haven't lived in since you were a child. Thank you. There's a series of questions, so I want to just shift gear a little bit and focus on two areas. Um, one is around the slowness of change. Um, you talked in your presentation and so powerfully in your book. And so there's a series of questions that says, what more can be done to put pressure on to sustain the pressure and what role can can your book and the guardian play in making that happen and then linked to that is there's been a really interesting flurry of activity in terms of the questions of people wanting to help people to, you know wanting to use their voice their power their authority to try and make this difference so just welcome your comments and reflections so um in, in terms of in terms of the book, I, I mean, I, you know, I think the book is an explanation. I am glad that it's there as a, a document that makes it absolutely clear what happened and illustrates the scale and and um, se severity of what happened in a way that sometimes it's hard to do in a newspaper article. But I think um, <laughs> really that it, newspaper articles um, can be very um, impactful and can shame the government into action in um, really powerful ways. And, and I don't say that to kind of congratulate The Guardian, but I suppose I say it more to um, illustrate how, um, how cowardly isn't the right word, but how shameless almost that the Home Office can be in the sense that they do respond to negative media pressure and they do um, work quite quickly to put individual cases right once they've, um, once they've been highlighted in the paper. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so I do think that, that um, as journalists, we've got a real responsibility to go on writing about this, even though, um, you know, even though it's an issue that we've been highlighting now at The Guardian for over three years, 
um, I think there is an understanding from our editor um, that this is something we have to go on writing about because every time the kind of spotlight um, disappears from the issue, I, I think within the Home Office, there's, there's a kind of slight relaxation and they, there, is a, there is a response to negative um, pub publicity. Um, in terms of individuals, um, there are, there are um, a, a number of kind of grassroots organizations that are um, supporting um, Windrush, um, people affected by Windrush. Um, most of those are kind of mostly active on on Twitter, and um, they are, um, for example, um, the Windrush Defenders, Windrush Lives, the Windrush Action Group. Um, there's one in in Manchester. I, I'm wondering if what I might do is put a list of them on on Twitter on my account after this, and and then people can look at them. Um, but in terms of supporting charities that have really worked um, kind of constructively on this. Um, the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, that's the JCWI, has done really, really um, positive work on this, as has an organisation called Praxis and uh, the Refugee and Migrant Centre in Wolverhampton. But let me put all of those um, in, in um, I'll, I'll do it probably this evening, yeah. Great, thank you. Um... There are more questions than I knew we would get through, but I can't finish the evening. So um, colleagues, bear with me because I think this is a really important one and we might just run slightly over. But a number of questions have come through on this theme and I think it's a really pertinent one to kind of finish on. The one is the legacy of Windrush. What do you think the scandal um, has taught us in terms of being at the forefront of public attention? What's the legacy it leaves? And I guess equally important, what do we learn from it to ensure this never happens again? So um, the report that was published a year ago by Wendy Williams is, is a really, really um, a amazing investigation in, into what went wrong. And one of the areas that she highlights and re really kind of interestingly is around um, uh, this this ignorance of our own history and um she says that that we have um a kind of institutional ignorance on the subject of race and on the history of the windrush generation which is consistent with institutional racism and i think that that is really an important kind of reminder because um this history of migration from the countries that used to make up Britain's empire is very, very recent history. Um, it is, um, you, you know, it's a phenomenon that we should all be really, really familiar with. And yet the policymakers and the, um, um, the um, ministers who were responsible for this legislation didn't know it and and weren't um kind of properly engaged with it there's there's a kind of a parallel um recommendation that she makes that um we need to have much better um education within the department and of ministers and of civil servants about the history of um empire in britain and i think that that really chimes with a, a discussion that's been happening around the national curriculum um, and it's yeah it is um, incredibly um, thought-provoking um, in terms of in terms of what we um, in terms of the kind of wider um, lessons for politicians I, I had a really interesting um, conversation with um, Amber Rudd um, a few months after she resigned and she said that that when you're in a kind of senior um, role in the government, you become quite uh, thick skinned and quite hardened to individual problems that land on, on your desk. And, and she said that she hoped um, that, the, that the kind of the way that all of these um, individual problems had, had been ignored and um, not 
seen as a bigger picture. He hoped that that would be instructive for people, um, for ministers in, in the future. I kind of really like to think that that is, uh, that that is a, a lesson that really gets learnt, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I really want to end in a positive way. I really do, because um, I, I mean, I think certainly for me, um, the, the, the key lesson has been that although, um, you know, working on, on um, investigative subjects sometimes is a really slow and frustrating and, and difficult process, um, you do have to kind of remember that sometimes yeah, sometimes it does work and sometimes change um, can be forced. So yes, it's quite important not to get too cynical, <laughs> I suppose. Right, thank you. Amelia, thank you so much. Um, it's been both a really powerful, sobering presentation, but really insightful to be able to engage with you about you know, both the challenges that this has posed and how it's affected people in real life but you've also helped us understand and unraveled some of the complexities behind it, but also how much more work that we've got to do. And so on behalf of the University of York and um, the, the lecture series programme, we can't thank you enough. There's been just a huge flurry of really thought provoking questions and we were never gonna be able to cover them all, but I hope we've covered the key ones. Um, I would also like to say that the recording of this event will be available on York Ideas YouTube channel, which you can access by typing York Ideas YouTube into Google. However, please just wait a couple of days for this appear. And I know there'll be lots of people that want to pick up on some of the things that you were saying, and you'll be able to do so. If you would like to purchase a copy of Amelia's book, copies of The Windrush Betrayal, with assigned book plates will be available from our partners. For more information on book sales, please see our website or head directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk University of York. And we've put that slide up for you. If you've enjoyed tonight's events, you may also be interested in some of our other events taking place over the next fortnight as part of our open lecture programme. The details of these can be found on screen now, as well as copied in the Zoom chat box below. We very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with York Ideas through our open lecture series. Check out the website, york.ac.uk hash events for full details, of all of the events in the open lecture programmes. We'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and to continue the conversation using the hashtag York Ideas. So it just leaves me to say a huge thank you again to Amelia, our keynote speaker, for what has been both an insightful, challenging and thought provoking discussion and presentation. Telling the stories of real life people affected by the Windrush scandal, but also helping shine a really important light on these issues so that we learn from them and we challenge them and hopefully we do not find ourselves in this situation again. Amelia, a really heartfelt thank you to you and we've just been so delighted to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.